to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to Power Talk Friday on a well-designed business. On the show today, Rebecca Richardson is with us. Rebecca is the Director of Marketing for Charles Cunniff Architects in Aspen, Colorado. She is also on part of the management committee at this firm. And within that committee, part of her responsibility is the hiring process for the firm. And this is exactly what Rebecca and I talk about today. She goes through some of the, first of all, she goes through the process that she uses for hiring. And then and she shares with us some of the key questions and the things that she's looking for when she's interviewing candidates. And have no fear, we relate this to you if you are a solo interior designer looking to make your first hire, or if you are running a larger or a mid-sized firm and you just would look, looking for a direct process for your hiring. Now, let me tell you a little bit about both Rebecca and Charles Cunniff Architects. Rebecca joined CCA in 2006 and it is under her leadership as Director of Marketing that they widely increase their market reach while decreasing their marketing expen- expenditures. So that's pretty cool. And it's her keen eye for design that led to the complete redesign of the company's marketing materials materials, their website, and the addition of their social media outlets. Her appreciation for design and sustainable business practices has become instrumental in the operations at CCA. Now, CCA is a sort of a little powerhouse architecture firm there. They have 19 people on staff, and for the last four years running, they have been named as best places to work. And more recently, in, in November of 2017, their Elk P Ranch project was name Home of the Year by Mountain Living Magazine. I looked at this on their website. The home is 15,000 square feet and it is truly spectacular. So check out their website and or check out my Instagram feed today because I will be featuring their work all day. So if you are unaware of that, if you have been a longtime listener of the podcast and you have not been following me on Instagram, which is at Luann Nigara, L-U-A-N-N-N. N I G A R A, then you, you know, you're in the know on what's happening on the podcast, but you don't realize and you haven't been aware that every single day a show goes live, I feature the work of that interior designer or that firm, or in this case, the architecture firm of CCA. So be sure to follow me over on Instagram so you're in on that part of the party too. Okay. Now, and as long as I'm sending you to check out websites and Instagrams, I want to remind you that Kravit launched their new website. Yep, fully redesigned, more features. The blog Inspired is there. Easy navigation now between their brands, Kravit, Lee Jofa, and Brunchwick and & Fee. And the best part is that Kravit has a new code for you as a listener of this podcast. You can have 10% off any one purchase of Kravit fabric, trimmings, or wallpaper. So think about this. For the last two years, they have given you 10% off any one purchase on the curatedkravit.com platform. But now, starting now, you can use it for any purchase of Kravit fabric, Kravit trim, or Kravit wallpaper, okay? So you're going to use the code at checkout, AWDB10, a well-designed business 10, okay? So it's AWDB10 at checkout. Okay, so um, this is good news because I know it's very, very easy to order Kravit fabric or wallpaper or trim. Okay, all right, visit the the website today and be sure to use your code AWDB10. All righty, let us get to talking with Rebecca about this hiring process. Hey. 
Hey, Rebecca, thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I have literally, uh, honestly been asked this question so recently, and so this is so timely for us. Um, you, in your role, I explained in introduction that in addition to being director of marketing for Charles Knuff Associ uh, Architects, you are also on the management committee and that you are in charge of hiring. So we're just going to put our disclaimer out, right, Rebecca, that you are not <laughs> an HR person. So you play a doctor on TV, but you're not really a doctor. <laughs> correct, correct. Yeah. And, and in a lot of small, you know, small to mid-sized businesses, we wear a lot of hats and I happen to wear a few different hats in the office. So yeah. I'm happy to help out where I can. Yeah. So we're, we're talking about your, what you have learned and you have cultivated as a skill set for being a, 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 an intuitive hiring person. We are not talking about the legalities of HR. <laughs> right. So, you know, and the thing is, you know, for a lot of smaller interior design firms, a lot of the rules for HR don't apply to us if we have businesses that are under three people and all that stuff. I mean, there's certain legal things that always apply, um, you know, not asking about somebody's race and their religion and things like that, that you'll cover for us. That's the, the obvious. But the thing is that uh, they, we do have designers listening that have 10 and 20 employees and therefore some of these legalities do play in and but we're not doing that we're talking about the intuitive process we're talking about uh the skill set of interviewing and how to identify talent and how to nurture talent and how to you know be successful in your first hire so all righty our disclaimer is duly <laughs> taken care of <laughs> wonderful <laughs> that's it so it's, before we get into it we talked about how you do sit on the management committee for this rather, you know, look, it's not a super, super huge architectural firm because we know that some architectural firms can be in the, you know, three, four, five dozen employees, but it's, you know, 19 people that work there. It's not a small, small firm either. So tell us a little bit before you start in your how to hire the structure of the firm and about that management committee and what some of the roles are at underneath the management committee so that we have a sense of what work is like, life is like over there. Sure. Yes. So um, Charles Kenneth Architects is owned by the man himself, Charles Kenneth, um, and he's a sole proprietor. And he brought a few of us together to form a management committee to kind of look at the business side of architecture. He's very much an artist and incredible at what he does and he needed obviously some structure to that so we have a director of finance who handles all of our billing and he also does the hr um along you know the kind of nuts and bolts of the hr process and then um, a senior project architect who is obviously entrenched in running of projects um, the general manager who kind of oversees the office as a whole um, and myself um, and i kind of lead lead the process in, in terms of leading the meetings and when it comes to hiring, figuring out what we need, what per, where we need that person, when we need that person, and then that whole process. And then um, our executive manager, who's um, kind of like an office manager who kind of manages the day-to-day -day operations of the business. So it's a nice way to have people who have, you know, we have our normal jobs. And then on top of that, this um, management committee, we meet every other week after our monthly or our uh, weekly staff meeting to run through kind of the hot topics. We try to keep the meetings pretty brief and, and, you know, expand them when we need to, but it's a nice way to kind of keep the ship running, if you will. So, I mean, I'm just going to say you had me at hello when you said <laughs> that <laughs> Charles recognized that his strength is design and that's where his passion and his strength is. And so he gathers his dream team to make sure that the business side is attended to. I mean, I'm like, right. Okay. Right there. I'm like, I'm in love. <laughs> right. And I have to say he's really good at um, bringing in top talent to make sure that what he envisions is the studio environment really gets taken through all the way through the design process. Um, and then everyone else on the firm, you know, we can be in a managed meeting as well and we'll need to bring in two or three other people to come talk, talk through a topic. So we'll bring in, you know, a job captain or, a, you know, someone who's been with the firm for a month to say, you know, Hey, we're on this topic. We want to get your thoughts. How, you know, what have you done at your other firms? 
And so it's a really nice approach to it. Um, not So you're not in meetings all the time, non, in a non-billable way, but you're doing what you need to do to keep the business side running smooth. Very smart. I love it. That's awesome. So, so and it, it sounded like you said in there, this the people that are on this management committee, they also have regular responsibilities. So for instance, you are director of marketing, but somebody on the management committee might also be a project manager or a senior architect, or do they just fill this role of the management committee and they don't have day-to-day operations or responsibilities within the architecture firm? So we all have our normal, you know, eight to five jobs within the firm and this is on top of it. So if you um, want to be involved and we, you know, it's not a closed door thing. If someone wants to be involved, we certainly will welcome that. They just have to know you have to do this in addition to um, the work that you need to get done. And all of us really, you know, we're invested in the firm with our hearts and souls and we want things to run better. And um, it's kind of striving to always improve our business function. That's interesting because I know we're going to go to how to hire, but I just heard something that I'm curious about. Yeah. I have to, I have to believe that if you are responsible for this on top of your regular position, that there's some sort of monetary inducement or reward for doing it. But I also have to believe that there's something else that you get out of doing it because people don't work extra hours for just money. Most people do not. Like at this level, you when you have a minimum wage job and you are in high school and you are going to work 10 hours and you need more money than that, you work 15 hours. But when you're a grown-up adult and you have a good-paying job, you don't often do the extra just for money. You do it for something else. So what what is happening there that encourages and makes it so that your team is interested and wants to be a part of that next level of the commitment to the company? That's a really good question. I think that looking at the personalities on the management team, I think that we're all kind of those, that personality that um, you can't watch a sinking ship sink Mm. and you just want to, you want to help. So I think that we all kind of come from the standpoint of, we know what runs smoothly. We know where the problems are because every company, you know, with this many people, you have personality type differences or business challenges, the economy, you know, what have you. And I think we're all kind of, of that mindset to really, let's just get together put our heads together, fix things, and then move to the next. So Mm. we try to keep things pretty streamlined with when we meet and how long we meet and the subjects we tackle and um, just work through things methodically because we do have to get onto the next thing. But again, I think it goes back to we're just kind of fix it types, Mm. I guess. (laughs) Okay. Okay. And would you say, I know you have to be careful because Charles will probably hear this, but (laughs) (laughs) would you say that it is that he, because here's the thing, I could respect either one of these. Either he is truly a good leader and understands the value of all this and actually is also leading each of you, even though he has tasked each of you with these higher level positions. Or I also could have total respect for a person who said, I'm an excellent architect and that's what I love to do all day long. And I need to pay attention to these things, but it's not what I want to pay attention to. So I'm going to empower people to do it really well and I'll sort of watch them do it and I'll be here to say yes or no to the big stuff but I'm not the leader of that group you know what I mean not the leader Mm -hmm. but I'm not the driver which which one is he I'm curious I think he's the empowerment you know if we go through someone brings a, a new software to the table and you know he's not using these rendering softwares on a day-to-day basis, but he knows that at least half the company is interested or a quarter of the company is interested and it will make us do our jobs better. He will absolutely, you know, figure out the best funding for that and fund it. Mm. So I think he's, he's hands off in that regard. I do have to say though, from the design side, he's not the principal that the client meets in the beginning and then at the end, you know, so he's really involved in so much of the business. So he has his hands in everything and in every project and is very much present. So I think his time, he can only spend so much time. Mm -hmm. So it's both an empowerment thing and um, a practicality Mm -hmm. where he trusts us to, okay, I'm going to own this. And if I say I'm going to own this, you know, the hiring part, he knows 
I'm going through A to Z and then I report to him and then we talk through it. So mm -hmm. he empowers, he trusts, but I think that to also be on this management committee, you kind of have to sign up for it and make sure that you are fulfilling the role that you said you would fulfill. Right. Well, that's really very interesting because so often, whether it's an architect architecture firm or an interior design firm, once you grow it up to a certain level, like this one, 19 people, so often the principal is not designing any longer. And, and, and a lot of it's, it's one thing if it's by design that they're not designing. That's another model, right? That's a model that you could say, hey, I love being in this world. I've built this up. I've spent 25 years designing and now I'm very happy to manage everybody designing under me. But a lot of times it's just you wake up and you're like, whoa, I grew my firm so big and now I don't even get to do the projects anymore because I'm so busy being the hiring person, being the marketing person, being the this right. person. You know what I mean? Certainly not when you have 20 employees, but when you have eight employees, say. Sure. You, you sure. Know, you're, you, you, you're doing the business part. And so it's very, it's very interesting to hear and to see that it sounds like intentionally – he has a desire to not only grow the firm, but to always stay knee deep in the design and the architecture part of the firm. And instead of just letting the ship run around rudderless, he understood to gather a team of experts within his firm to make sure that all the components were happening. Right. And at the wow. same time with the, the project architects running the projects, I mean, obviously he's not doing the right. in, in and out you know, designing the computer and whatnot, but he certainly has his design mm -hmm. um, influence on each project. Uh, at the same time, he also hires very strong project managers that the clients themselves feel very comfortable yes. that, yeah, Charles doesn't have to be in every meeting, right. but they know he's involved to a point that they're comfortable with. Some want him every meeting. Sometimes it's not required. And so of projects of different sizes and um, capacity. So it fluctuates for sure, but he definitely um, likes to hire well, which is why we've really spent a lot of time refining our hiring process for the past, say, 10 years. Mm, okay. And that's a perfect segue, Rebecca. So Great. tell us about that process. You are the one who's responsible for it. And walk us through some of the best practices for knowing when to hire and how to go about it. And I know I'm going to share with everybody that Rebecca is, we talked about this. This is not just ideas and concepts for a bigger firm. These apply to if you are a, an interior designer and you're looking to make your first hire or you've got two hires and you're making your third. So we're this conversation is going to cover all of it because a lot of it is actually the same. It's just more scaled, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, and how we approach it is, you know, we're, we run between 18 and 20 people as kind of our sweet spot. So, um, and each person we bring on, is very much like family to us. I mean, we spend eight to 10 hours a day with each other five days a week. And um, we're small enough that we know everybody in the office and know each other's families. And, and really, when we decide to bring someone on, we look at it from a short, you know, seem, sometimes you look at short term, oh, we have all these projects coming on board. But we really try to look at long term. And I think that last economic downturn really gave us um, some good insight into that. And we saw so many firms who had staffed up so extraordinarily. And then as soon as things got rough, quickly started making cuts. And we actually were fortunate enough. We made a few cuts, but they were, there were employees that we kind of needed to um, part ways with anyways. So mm. we kind of, we kept, we leaned up a little bit, I would say, but we really did. We were able to maintain our staff because just keeping that, keeping that longevity in mind. So I think when we look at hiring again, we're very careful to look at, okay, so we think we're ready, but if we lost, you know, a third of these projects, can we still support another person? What would that role look like? So we really look at it from a holistic view and before we even say, okay, we're hiring. Um, and then we really try to figure out what role that is. Um, and with design roles, you know, sometimes you need a utility person that, can run a s several different projects for you um, or tasks on projects. And sometimes you have a defined role. So we just went through the exercise recently of, um, of 
rewriting, we had some job descriptions that really needed some work to take into the next 10 years. So we just rewrote all of our job descriptions, which was a really good exercise to kind of look at who we have on staff, where their skills are, but where we want them to be and, and our expectations. So if you can, um, and you know, and I would suggest doing this is when you decide, okay, we need to bring on one person or two people, sit down and say, what, what would that role be? It doesn't have to be exact title. If you don't want to go that route and get kind of caught up on titles, because mm -hmm. sometimes that can be cumbersome, but just figuring out within your office structure, what would be the most advantageous. And then kind of once you figured out what you need, what your team needs, um, then putting your feelers out. Um, which can happen in a lot of different ways. We first like to, when we decide we're going to bring on another person, we usually talk with our staff. You know, usually we have a lot of heads nodding. Yes, we need someone. We need someone because <laughs> they've <us>. already, <laughs> exactly. They've already <laughs> felt the, the need for someone, but we, you know, we want to be methodical about it. And then we, you know, let them know if you know of anyone, please you know, put the word out that we're looking because we'd certainly rather have someone bring someone in that um, another person on our staff recommends. Mm. That would be the best case scenario. So, so I, I yeah. can I want to ask you one question before you go there, back in what you said. When you discussed how you hire for longevity as opposed to hiring for ramping up because you've, you're looking at your pipeline, you mm -hmm. said that. So the question with that is, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean that you might be actually looking at a full pipeline and so you're like, hey, we need to make a hire. But does that mean, is that tweak there in our mind? Okay, so if we were to hire this person, they will fulfill the role for helping us with this heavy burden for the next, say, six months of this pipeline. But if the pipeline were to take a lull after that, what other roles would this person have if we were to keep them on? And that's what you're doing in that first pre-interview and identifying the position process that you're saying, okay, this role, but absent this pipeline, these roles. Is that what you're, was that what you're describing? A, a little bit. I think it's this project. And if that project were to go away, if we have two or three other projects that we could immediately put that person on or that are in the pipeline, so not oh. a role change per se, but okay. more of a project change. You know, if you have, you know, three different projects running and you're thinking, okay, we need someone now for this project. Well, if that project were to go away, I still have two other projects that could really use another person on that team. Okay. So, so you're looking to sure see, the pipeline's right. Pretty deep. Yeah. Okay. So you're looking to see that you're, you need somebody to do the one that's coming that you're just signed the contract on, or we're about to sign the contract or need to know that you have the help in order to, in good conscience, right. sign the contract. But you're looking at the other existing projects to say, if that weren't there, is there enough work within these projects to put this person to work every day? Exactly. While okay. you shop for another client. For right, 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 so, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. That's smart. Okay. Okay. I'm, I, I, that's awesome. I, I'm glad to understand that. It's a good way to look at it. So, so now take us now. So now we've decided that we have enough work for them if we don't sign the pending contract. Um, and you now come to your existing team and say, does anybody know of anybody quality that they want to recommend for a position? And beyond that, where do we go? Right, exactly. So, um, and then typically we place an ad and every town is different in, in what avenues you choose. Um, you know, online, Indeed, ZipRecruiter, some people use Craigslist. Um, and we use for, in architecture, the American Institute of Architects has a job portal, which is great. So um, an ASID, I'm not sure if they have one or what the avenues would be there exactly, but um, typically we post a job ad and you know, crafting the language of that, just kind of sitting down and, and knowing what you're looking for. If you're looking for entry level person or someone that has two to three, you know, two to three years of experience outside of the office or outside of school or someone who is a seasoned um, mm. designer. So kind of writing up uh, a short and, you know, in my experience, I will put an ad in for a senior project architect and I will get, you know, plumbers <laughs> sending in resumes <laughs> to and everyone in between so you kind of you'll get a lot of what you don't need but it is good because sometimes I have found 
a junior level person when we were in search of a higher level person, mm. but it was a great junior level person. And so we, we brought them on. So, you, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's okay to cast a wide net and, or it's okay to go for a defined role okay. depending on what your needs are. Um, and then, you know, the resumes start coming in. I always ask for a resume portfolio and list of references just to kind of see what people send in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it's hard to look at them as they come in. So what I usually do is put them in a in an inbox folder that I just collect. And then personally, I like to respond to everyone who sends in a resume. I remember job hunting and it's just such a, uh -huh. it's hard to be on the other side of it. So I always try to let people That's know. That's so nice of you. It. <laughs> you know, it takes a little bit of time, but if you kind of do it in a big batch and say, okay, I'm going to over my morning coffee, mm -hmm. respond at least let people know that we'll let them, we'll let you know if you've been selected for an interview and just kind of. That's it. it. We're that not going to, you know, email you every other day of the week and let you know the status. If, you, if, I, exactly. if I email you back, you're in. If I don't, move on with your life. But at it's, least you're courteous <laughs> right right so I, hard when you send your resume off into no man's land and I know. you never know if it got there so um and then I kind of keep track too because some people will call the office and say you know I wanted to make sure you you receive my you know my resume package and it's good to know who, right who does kind of that about it exactly and again it it's not a big defining um moment but it's just kind of when you look at the whole the whole package. So, um, so at some point when I kind of feel like there's a lull in receiving resumes, then I'll go through and, and sit down and look one by one at each one. Um, and I usually t make a list, you know, the person's name and how many years of schooling they have, um, if it's in how many positions they've had, um, and kind of go through, little by little of, of what they have on their resume. And the tricky thing with resumes is sometimes people can look really good on a resume, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not the right fit. So I've learned through, you know, the hard way and, and the long way to kind of read between the lines when you're looking at a resume. Um, if someone had a gap in um, between jobs for over a year, I usually will ask if they, we, if I select them for an interview. Um, and, you know, kind of as I go through the resume, kind of jot down questions. Why, if, you know, three jobs in a row, they left after a year mm. or two years asking why. Um, kind of reading, kind of putting that, I don't know, psychological spin on it, but it's, it's good true. because yeah. you can really get in there and learn. So, what I do is, you know, sit down, print each one or make notes on a PDF, um, just all my questions that really spark into my head, look at their portfolio. Does their style, it doesn't have to be the same style as our firm, not at all, but is the quality there? Is the um, the aesthetic kind of feel to it? If it's a real jumbled up um, portfolio package, it's just hurts to look at you know that, that's hard because you, you know you, you never want to just dismiss it but you have to kind of look at the resume the cover letter and the portfolio as this one big story and then I kind of get like a short list of of people that I'm interested in and then I'll look at their LinkedIn accounts um, to make sure that you know just cross-checking their resume to LinkedIn to make sure dates on what they said are true and you know, kind of trying to really get in between the lines a little bit. Um, look at their social media accounts. It, are, did, does it look like someone that you would want to have proudly represent your firm um, when you look at Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, if they do that? Or, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, again, it's not a, a deal breaker, but it gives you, you know, now that we have all of these resources, we mm -hmm. might as well use them to mm -hmm. see what kind of the whole picture of the person and is that as important? I know that's important, and a lot of people talk about that when they're hiring the entry level, the kids, the kids who are going to make dumb mistakes and put them out in social media. Let's be real, right? right. <laughs> but, oh, absolutely. You know, but do you find that if you're interviewing for the thirty-five to forty-year-old person or thirty to forty-year-old person, that it's as important or most people cleaned up and got their stuff together by then? <laughs> I would say, yeah, I would say, you know, and any, even with a younger person, you know, 
you got to take college for what it is. You'll and give and some leeway, to. right? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and um, you know, we happen to be based in Aspen, Colorado, so oh, people wow. are typically, if they want to live and work in Aspen, you know, most people are of the outdoor right. pursuit mindset, so you see a lot of that. But I would say, yeah, typically when <laughs> someone gets a little bit more seasoned, they're a little more cleaned up, but. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes not. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's it sounds like you approach it as a human being. You're like, right. you know what I mean. And so, I, and so, I have a question. When we talk about hiring the entry level person, mm-hmm. one of the things that I have noticed with this whole age of email and all of this other stuff is that you you're going to you're going to talk to us about how like you said sometimes somebody presents well on a resume and what you to look for to make sure it's not just that presentation that there's some substance or something in there that you're the little things you're looking for but also too sometimes it's hard to stand out on a resume when you are entry level i remember when my youngest was graduating out of georgetown and first of all when you said that you at least acknowledged that you received their resume i thought that was amazing because i remember her sending out dozens and nobody even yeah. you know and, and following up did you get it it's like you know you get some person right. on the phone that's like i don't know that went to the hr and they this or they that or whatever but the thing is i also remember there were positions that i thought that she was could have been could, particularly well suited for and in order to stand out among the noise because when Mm -hmm. I would go when I was younger I always had the chance you had to interview somebody in person they had to you know you could mail a resume that's not that it didn't happen but it just wasn't the same and I feel like I talked my way into almost every single job I have including owning this company (laughs) right right you know it is really true to see how do you stand out I think that one of the things that really stands out to me is um, when a, when someone in college has done an internship or two. Mm-hmm, if someone mm-hmm. every summer was a rafting guide or, you know, those can be really great things. But when you're a small business and you need someone to start yesterday and you need them to know how to kind of function in an office and how to answer the phone or how to, you know, just kind of handle themselves within an office structure because you don't have time to really take them through a really long and thorough training process. Um, uh, The ones that really stick out to me when I'm looking at younger resumes are definitely ones who have taken the initiative in college to do a summer internship or two. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that goes so far and it doesn't have to be anything, you know, it's, anything expansive it's just knowing that you've you've spent some time in an office you can you can kind of work your way around it a little bit and we can get you going right i like that too because it's not so much i love i love what where your your evaluation from it is coming because you're not saying that it's so much they did an internship so they're a type a driven personality it's more like your actual translation of I'm hiring somebody because I I don't have a six weeks you know HR program where we're going to teach you how to answer the phone and how to right. you know do this. You need them to walk through the door and for as much as humanly possible hit the ground running. And so having had those internships says to you that they've at least had experience in an office. So I like that. That's a different twist on oh they're such a type A person that they've had internships. So interesting. Right. You're looking for the actual practical value of them having functioned in an office office already. Exactly. Yeah. And, and and it shows that they're enthusiastic. It's something they've thought about. And a lot of times they, it's just that last, that senior year that they, you know, maybe the first three years of school, they did have fun. And like, gosh, I, I mean, I had so much fun. But towards <laughs> the end, you start thinking about what I'm going to do. And right. we've been really successful with people who have had some office experience. It helps them. And, and so, you know, I would encourage if right. there's any listeners that are going to college, just get one under your belt. It's, it's really, it really stands out on a resume right. for sure. And also too, you know, the typical Libra in me has to look at, you know, the other side of it as well, is that if you are someone that really understands that once you do get your first job, you are going to work and put the pedal to the metal and never look back. And you really are, your family and everybody are on board with your taking your college years and your summers as the last time that you're going to have fun. I mean, isn't that what everybody says? It's not right. true. Hello, it's not true, everybody. But- <laughs> 
again. <laughs> you know, never going to have fun again. Um, right. So, but the thing about it is, is that's okay too. Just don't expect that probably a firm of 15 or 18 or 20 people is going to really give you a shot. You're then really almost going to have to rely on going out to a firm that's a one or a two person firm where you can make that impression and, and learn. And then after that's where you're going to look for some work experience to maybe hire them for, for a firm like yourself, right? So you can have fun if you're in college and you're listening, you can. You just understand that it's going to close some doors is all that we're saying. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. And it's, and again, it can be one one or two internships on, you know, a summer break, mm-hmm. you know, more so than a holiday break, but but something on there that makes us see something besides school. Mm-hmm. And I think in the, in the competitive world that we're, we're in now, I think that it, it, it just makes you stand out a little mm-hmm. bit. And it's also a good lesson for a solo who's out there and thinking they're looking for somebody to hire their first hire is that is something to consider that somebody can really come in, knock your socks off, make a great impression. But if it's their first experience working other than at the Dairy Queen, that you're going to teach them a lot more than just your product process and what uh, what to do for your firm. You're going to first start teaching them how to handle themselves in a business environment. And again, right. totally fine. Just know that's what you're up for. And if you're, right. you know, if you're a solo and you're already busy and you really don't have time for that, you need them to be polished and have a certain level of, um, you know, social skills is really what we're talking about, you know, um, out the gate, then look for some, somebody with an internship. So it's a great tip. I love it. Right. And it go, kind of goes back to too, when you're looking at what do we need, what kind of person when, well, what skill set, if you're going for that more entry level person, know that there'll be some front end time that you'll mm-hmm. need to take. And sometimes that's really great too, because you can groom them, you know, if they're early in their career, you can groom them to, to kind of do things the way you want your office to function, mm-hmm. whether, you know, versus someone who come came in with experience and, you know, they learned a bunch of different mm-hmm. ways to do things. So there's give and take for all of it, but kind of, yeah, like you said, knowing what you're up for is, okay. is key. Good, good, good. All right. So I do want to know a little bit about, because I know that you have expertise in helping us know when it is time to hire, but I, and, and how to know if you should do it despite being afraid of knowing if you can afford it and everything else. But my question is, do we go there next or do we keep on with the process of, of going through the interview process? Which way do you want to go? I just want to make sure we do the other is my point. Yeah, I think go through the interview okay. process. So yeah, go to like phone interview. Would be okay. What I do okay. So so let's talk about this then from the standpoint of our colleagues listening who are going to conduct the phone interview as opposed to the design students listening who are going to make the phone interview. So let's take, yeah. they, you guys have to listen and figure it out, but we're going to teach our design colleagues how to conduct a phone interview. Great. So typically what I do is get a short list of interviewees um, and then, you you know, typically I'd email to set up to an interview and and kind of watch that process, see how they respond, um, how is their writing in their email, kind of just looking at everything, set up a time. Um, And usually I just start off by explaining, you know, get on the phone and talk about our company a little bit. Typically, hopefully, they've looked at um, our website, looked at the projects we do, kind of get a feel for our culture a little bit, and then kind of dive into questions. And what I do with the phone interview, it's a good way to kind of hear the person out, um, get a feel for their personality type, see how they answer some of the questions, it's very efficient. It's very quick. Um, and then if it goes on and we want to continue the process, then we do a in-person or Skype interview, depending on if they're in town or out of town. So with this phone interview, I'll typically ask, um, kind of go through their resume and ask those questions and of, you know, job by job, tell me about the job, you know, who did you report to, what was the structure at that firm, if it was a large firm or small firm, and, you know, how did you like that structure, and then you can think about your own structure and how they answer the questions, Mm -hmm. Um, if they really, if you're a big firm and and they liked really small firms, you kind of, you know, just listen to that and and hear those, hear those answers, Um, and, 
talk about get it get to know them kind of more on a personal level what's the favorite part of their design process um are you so one question i like to ask is are you someone who likes to ask a lot of questions or do you prefer to figure things out on your own before you ask questions and that can kind of tell you if if someone is a real kind of a solo artist and likes to do things on their own and and you know and and, and you think about in your own mind how that fits into your firm um culture and then how they, you know, how do you keep yourself organized on a daily or weekly basis? Um, do you prefer working on a team or individually? Um, do you prefer a fast paced environment or do you like a slower methodical approach? And again, it's asking questions that are kind of talking about their personality and their work personality to see how they answer the questions. And then you think about how that would fit into your culture. Mm. Um, I always ask if how you how they think their coworkers would describe their work work ethic. And typically people will <laughs> obviously <laughs> answer what you think they I mean they think that you want to hear. Right. So you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. Um, and then talking about accuracy and drawings, how do how do you rate yourself? And this kind of goes into if we continue and do a reference check, I will ask the reference and we'll go into this later, but ask the references some of these questions too to see how they match up or don't match up. Um, I like to know what motivates and inspires. And then asking about more practical questions, what's your next ideal um, uh, position? And, and that's a telling question because if someone is earlier in their career, but they want to be managing their own clients and in client meetings, but if you look at their resume and they're definitely, it doesn't appear to be there, that kind of tells you a little bit, maybe they want more than they're ready for. Mm. And that can be something on the hiring end that's really tough when someone comes in and, you know, at one level and they want to be at the next level, but they're not ready yet. And that's a hard thing to kind of manage through. So we try to kind of get in there and, and get into that mindset of, are they a little, are they, the entitlement level, mm. which, you know, we all hear about the millennials and, <laughs> and all of that. And there's, there's some trickiness in there. And, and we, talk, you know, I'll definitely ask um, um, if a job is short, you know, if they were somewhere for a year and then moved, you know, what made you decide that was the right time to move on? Mm -hmm. And, you know, were you given enough responsibility and, you know, things like that, you kind of have to get in there. And, and sometimes the reason I ask those questions on a phone interview is sometimes it's easier for people I found to answer those on the phone mm -hmm. versus face to face. There's, it's, I don't know if it's something more approachable or it's just, it's just less, Eye, to eye contact that makes it easier to kind of say, you know, I've had someone at say, well, I, I didn't get along with, you know, the person above me and that person was going to stay. So I thought it was time to go. Mm -hmm. And not that that's good or bad or, you know, but it's something to make you, you think about. And then you kind of, you kind of think about that throughout the process. Right. Well, that's a, uh, you know, look, that can be really a positive thing or it could be a negative thing, but you know, you take it in con context of all the other answers that you're getting. Right. Right. So if everything else about that person seems logical and clear thinking and they've assessed themselves pretty well and they say, I didn't get along with the person above me and it was him or me and he was going to stay, that's a great move, <laughs> you right. know, but if it's like, and that, and then my other boss and then the other person that exactly. worked for me, it's so Sort of like, okay, sweetie, we know who the problem was. <laughs> exactly. And it really is. If you have a few of those on the resume and a few times that that's happened, you figure <laughs> this is someone who's going to be maybe difficult to manage and I'm willing to take it on because of their skill set or, gosh, I don't think we can. Right. We, we don't have the time or, you know, the energy to take it on. So it just you're asking questions to for them to inform you of how they work, their personality type. Um, what they're looking for, because sometimes they're looking for something that's more than they're ready for. And mm -hmm. it's really important to know that before mm -hmm. you hire them. I like the one thing that you said in there. I liked a lot of things. I shouldn't say the one, but the one that I really liked is, you know, describe what your ideal position looks like, because mm -hmm. that really is brilliant question. And, and it's so funny because, you know, utilize it often in, you know, what I do for work, for window works. And when I'm talking and coaching with interior designers is I say to people all the time, ask 
people what they want so that right. you can deliver it. And that's really for us as, as salespeople, as designers who are trying to put clients in our pipeline, ask your client what they want so that you can deliver it is so logical. And in hiring, it's ask what they want so that you know if you have the right position for them, because there's no point in how there being a misunderstanding. If the answer is, like you said, I want to ma manage a team of, you know, blah, blah, blah. and you're like, um, right. you're five years away from that, lovey. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's really something that we try to, I, you know, I say to them right at the beginning, I want you to interview me as, as well as I interview you, mm -hmm. because we want you to, we want you to know that we are the right fit firm for you. Right. There's so many different firms and different structures and everyone's different and, and what they need is different. So I want you and I both to think that we're the lucky ones if mm -hmm. we end up working together mm -hmm. so that, um, it's a good marriage, basically. Yeah. And when I think about it in relation to an interior designer who is going to make their first hire as a design assistant, say, let's say that, right? So mm -hmm. if you ask that potential design assistant, you know, picture, t you know, describe for me your ideal job. If you come, you came work here, this is your ideal job. If the answer is, and I am sourcing all the fabrics and I'm doing all the floor plans and I'm doing all this, it's like, no, see, sweetie, that's my job. Right. You're going to go to the building and you're going to get the memo for me and you're going to put these things on a CAD for me right. and you are going to make lists right. of all the things that I still need to design. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and so that's really good because I have met younger designers that work for other people and they've said things to me like, I never get to do the design. And I'm like, is your name on the door? I, didn't, I missed that part. Like you're yeah, a exactly. two person firm. Yes. You're not going to, you right. know, you're there as support, <laughs> right? Right. And on the flip side, when you're hiring a senior level person, you know, you know, you want to know that they can run a team. That's and, right. And if they say their perfect design is taking a project start to finish on their own. And, you know, for our office in particular, very much a studio environment where we want teams of people working together as right. much as possible, then we know, okay, this person wants to run off and do their own thing. And maybe they had, you know, maybe they had their own firm and they just, mm. they want that, that single proprietor kind of feeling that's not a right fit that's in particular right fit for us. So, right. And that's so a good point of, because a bigger firm, if they're hiring a project manager, well, they're not going to have their fingers and everything. So you want to hear them say, I love overseeing all of the pieces and coming together and knowing that this part of the team has done this, this part of the team has done that. So these are very enlightening statements that you're sharing with us, Rebecca. I love it. I think it's really good because there's so many different ways to pick it apart for whether you're hiring for a big company or an individual designer making their first hire. Good. Okay. Right. So, okay. So now end, we get to that. Yeah. Go ahead. What's next? Yeah. And at the end, and I always at the end, um, definitely have them, you know, what questions do you have for me? And that's a great opportunity to see if they've looked at your website, if, you know, what kind of questions do they, do they ask? You know, what is a great question that I love that some people ask and not everyone does, you know, what is it like to work there? You've worked there for, you know, 11, 12 years, what, what is it like? And I think that's such a great question to ask mm. someone who's interviewing you because it makes them kind of take a personal side to it, you know, the day to day. And, and hopefully the person will answer you, you know, it's not, it's a job. So mm -hmm. it's a wonderful job, but there's, you know, the ins and outs of the normal career. So I think it's a good um, question to kind of, you know, get through towards the end. And then one thing I, we, I always finish is, is finding out their salary expectations right mm -hmm. in that first phone call, because if they want double what you can yeah. offer, then, you know, gosh, we're so far apart. Right. You know, you don't have to make any promises. You, you don't have right. to answer the question. I, I never, you know, talk about what we think, you know, we would offer for this position. It's where, where kind of where are you coming from? What are your expectations? Mm -hmm. Because, um, again, it, it kind of goes to that. Do we continue the conversation or do we end it here? So that begs the question, when you are putting out the initial feeler, whether it's from Indeed or the AIA uh, job portal, are you listing the, the range for salary or it sounds like you're not? We do not. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's, I, you know, I, I, we may, we might miss some candidates because we don't, mm -hmm. or we might, have a broader net because we don't, it's hard to know, but 
Right. Yeah. You as a philosophy don't because you feel like it gives you the ability to, like you said, you, you're going to see more people possibly, and therefore you have flexibility if somebody is – you might look. It, it happened to me. I say all the time with Kimberly. I was hiring a showroom administrator, which right. is one position. This is a particular very finite position. And when I met her, I was like, no, 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 no. I need her to do what I do. And so exactly. it was a completely different thing and therefore different criteria, different salary, different everything. So that gives you some flexibility to offer higher or lower for somebody that is experienced or really somebody that you want or whatever. Right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. So now you, you now weed out again. So now we go to, we've got, we've got however many people left. Do you have a cap on how many people you will ultimately let through the door for the face to face? Or is it really, if I've talked to 12 and 10 are good on the phone, I'm going to interview 10 or no cutthroat. I'm going to narrow these 12 phone calls down to three people or whatever it might be. It seems like it naturally kind of goes to that direction where you get down to, you know, three to five at most. Um, But typically that first phone call, if you spend the time and really ask the hard questions and kind of go through their resume and, and you know, when you're looking at the portfolio, tell me about this project and listen to how they speak about it. And if you're looking for, you know, someone who can really intelligently talk about their projects and the ins and outs and who did you work with and what was the team and what was your role in that team? Because sometimes people will put a project on their portfolio that, but their role was very small and Mm. all the beautiful imagery that you see (laughs) on the portfolio is not there. So I will ask. I was in the room when they did that. (laughs) It it, it is surprising to me. I went to the ribbon cutting. (laughs) Exactly. Yep. But you know, it's just, you know, you ask what would you do? Who did that rendering? Mm. You know, I will ask that question because you need to know, oh, we actually outsource that. I'm like, mm. oh, okay, good to know. Because in my mind, if I'm looking at a portfolio, I'm thinking that the person was instrumental in whatever they put on their portfolio, but it, that's not always the case. Right. So um, by the time I go through that phone interview, I typically can weed it down pretty pretty well Mm. not to a certain number but ones that I'm confident then taking to the team because the next step in that is to set up uh, a face to face interview or Skype interview with um, more people on our team typically um, a couple people on the management team and or a couple architects to say like okay let's sit down with this person and this and I want to confidently go to my team and say I've gone you know through the interview process, here's where we are. And I, I almost go to bat for this person because I think they're worth you guys talking okay. to him or her. So I have to feel confident that I've done my homework. Basically. Okay. So they're not coming through the door until you pretty much know that you, you kind of want them at some yeah. level. You might not be the one, there might be three that you want, but right. you want them for something. Okay. So yeah. we're not, we're, you've, you've gotten your criteria and your process pretty well thought out. Okay. Right. Okay. And what I do too is I, I load everyone's resumes into a folder um, and their portfolios so that everyone on the management team can look at those. Because if I missed someone, I certainly, you know, want others oh. to have the ability because what I pick up in a resume might be different than the next person. So um, having more eyes on it could, you know, is sometimes helpful. Okay. 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 Very good. And so what happens now? So now we are in our face-to-face. What are some of the questions that we want to ask in our face-to-face? What are some of the red flags that we want to look for in our face-to-face? What are we looking for here? So typically here, we, since they're meeting with different people in the firm, we'll, um, if, they're, if they come into the office, we'll usually do a quick tour of the office so they can get a, a view of you know, what it looks like, what the space is like, what are the people like, um, and and show them some projects that we're working on so they can see things in the works and where they're at and and just get a feel for it. It seems it's a nice way to kind of start the process of this second interview. Um, And then we have, we sit down and we ask them to bring in um, a set of drawings from a project, a recent project they've worked on so that we can sit down and ask them about, okay, tell us about this project. And then see how they answer that question, kind of the synopsis that they give and if they can intelligently speak about it, if it's a younger person or um, if a more seasoned person, you know, you ask a little bit more, you know, questions that are a little more in depth, but, um, and that's where we have an architect 
do a little bit more of a technical question mm. talking about, you know, we, we use Revit and SketchUp and Lumion and, you know, different software programs. So um, they'll ask, you know, different technical questions that, that kind of test, not test, but kind of gauge where someone is in um, the technical aspect mm -hmm. um, and point things out in drawings and, you know, why was you know, why was this done this way? Or, you know, just kind of get in there and not, again, not to be really testing the person, but just see, um, see how they can talk through uh, a design. Right. Uh, and then we talk about our team and how we structure the teams and the projects we could see them, you know, working on. And we have this project and this project to kind of show them if they did come to work with us what they would be working on and it's nice to see if some oh that that's you know that's really interesting because you want them to pick you typically people are interviewing for you know several different companies mm. so at the same time we want to pick them we also want them to be excited to work with us right so um and then just getting to know other people in the office having more people involved um, in the meeting and getting to know them. So sometimes they'll ask the same questions that I asked and go through the resume, but it, with a different lens because it's, they have a different role on the, in the office. So, um, it's a really nice way to kind of the process being the phone call and then the in person and the same thing can happen on Skype. Um, you know, a little bit different in, or a go to meeting. We use that as well. A little bit different. You can't show them the office, or um, with GoToMeeting, you can point, you know, use your computer to point and click at at different drawings. But you know, in person is is obviously mm, best. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of times, since we are in a little bit of a remote location, we do quite a bit on uh, on Skype or GoToMeeting. Okay. One of the couple of things in there that I want to point out that I like is that when you're asking them to discuss and present some of the information about something in their portfolio or the, you know, whether it's an architect asking or for designers asking the prospective employee about what technical things that they use that apply to interior designers, whether it be my Doma studio or it be whatever it may be, whatever schools Revit and SketchUp and all that stuff that you guys use too, <laughs> um, <All right. laughs> um, is that it's not so much that you're asking as a quiz. It's not so much that it's it's more the comfort level with it. You don't need somebody always to be completely skilled or educated depending on the level that you're hiring. Because again, I'm now thinking about the interior designer who's listening to us and she's looking or he's looking to make their first hire. So right. it's not that you need to know if a prospective employee knows everything. We don't expect them to know everything, but we want to know that they know their way around the conversation exactly. and to what level, because that's also like you said in something we talked about earlier is if it's all new, if they've never used Revit or SketchUp or CAD or any of the tools that interior designers need to use, then that principal just needs to understand that they will teach them everything. And maybe right. that's okay because maybe it's a principal that is not overwhelmed with a, a huge pipeline and it's a hire that's more about being prepared as opposed to I'm knee deep and I just signed five contracts and a month ago I had none and I do need somebody to hit the ground running. So I just keep bringing it back to the solo because I think a lot of firms that are bigger have the benefit of somebody like yourself. You know what I mean? That, right. that, and, and so that's great because you're sharing your expertise on it. And, and that's the whole point of this episode is to share some of that but I just want to keep stretching it back over to that way so that's very good I like I like those tips Rebecca and that's a really good point in that you just want it this whole thing is to figure out exactly where the person is and does this person fit right. where you need them to be right. and if and they very well could and sometimes what's I kind of going back to what's represented on paper is sometimes not 
exactly where they are. And by kind of just continuing the conversation and, and looking at it in a different way, looking at drawings or have them bring in um, some board project boards that they've put together for a project and having them talk. If you want this person to be in front of clients <laughs> and vendors, you want to hear how they describe a project and how they reference certain things. And so you want them to be able to speak speak well about the subject. If they come in and sure their the boards look pretty, but they can't present yes. present, then you need you just need to know that. And, right. And it kind of it goes back to again what is represented on paper and on resume, someone can look it on paper, but not be the right fit for you. So by spending, you know, it is more time, but that upfront time we have found when we, when we shortchange that upfront time, mm -hmm. it bites us every time because someone comes in the door and then, oh, you know, yes. <laughs> we, I wish we would have known that they're actually here you know, and not here. Right, right. This skill set, not that skill set. And of course, for for smaller solos, it's not as important always that the person comes through the door and that they're at level 10. But right. you want to, it's really what your point is, what level are you at? That's all right. I need to know. What level are you at? Am I putting you in front of a client next week? Or are you good enough and you have enough smoothness and enough present presentation that in a few months or six months, I, it was like me when I met Kimberly. I put, once I met her, that very night, that very night I met her, I knew I could teach her to do what I do, but I took her with me every single appointment for three years, teaching it to her. Right. You know, right. I, 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 I would just because I could see it in her didn't mean she was ready the next week. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. it, there's a there's something about somebody in the raw that you can tell. And she, you know, she had experience. She's a full fledged interior designer with a degree, and she had worked for a very uh, high powered interior designer. So I could see the skill set, and I don't even need her to be an interior designer, let's be real. I, I could see the other, the initiative and the 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 attitude and the just the, the, there was a brain behind the eyeballs. You know right. what I mean? Exactly. And so I just, you know, and then and so that's a good point. It's 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 to really intuit these things and understand for yourself, clarity for yourself, person hiring first. Do I need somebody skilled, out the gate, ready to hit the ground, represent my firm and work under me, but side by side with me and make things happen? Or am I okay to take this person in, have faith and confidence and trust and have them come next to me for three years or six months or whatever it is before I'm willing to put them in front of people? It's just being clear with yourself. I love it. Exactly. And always going back to, and sometimes you're, you're, you'll inform yourself. You'll start by advertising for, you know, one type of person. And then you go through the process and you, it really makes you think, because now you're finally putting the hat on of looking at what you need because you're so entrenched in, in your daily um, activities. But when you sit back and you're in the process, you're like, wait, I, I think we actually need this. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of evolve through the process as well. And it, and I think that just making sure that you spend that t upfront time, it will pay off in the long run because hopefully these people stay with you, mm -hmm. or, you know, for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. If you do, like you said, the, a little bit harder and more detailed work on the front end, it should pay off better on the back end. Yes. Right. Exactly. Okay. So then once we get through that, you know, that kind of second interview, um, you know, we, we, and we keep it, you know, for us, it's a little, it's a little more technical meaning. It's kind of getting entrenched a little bit more into the, the project side of thing. Um, and then if we want to continue the conversation, then we ask for references. Now this is key, I think. And I, it's amazing to me how many people don't check references. <laughs> um, and I think it's as key as interviewing the person, yeah. um, we usually ask for uh, three to five references. And what I, I like to get um, at least a previous employer, if not two. And one thing that I also look at, if someone has three previous jobs and they only list references <laughs> from reference. two, you know, kind of asking that question. Oh, well, you know, and you can ask it. Oh, is there a reason that you didn't, um, you know, include that third company? Mm -hmm. And, you know, always kind of trying to read between the lines a little bit. Right. Um, and, 
and I like to talk to, you know, a builder that they've worked with or another consultant, a lighting consultant or a kitchen consultant that they've worked with. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes, a, you know, what a client says, what a, a previous employer or, you know, a, a current employer or a current colleague will say, and someone who's a little bit more on the technical side, you know, you can ask the, um, the builder or an engineer, lighting designer, kind of, you know, how are their drawings when, you know, mm. were there a lot of mistakes in their drawings? Mm -hmm. When they did they deliver when they said they would deliver? Because sometimes the the, the tradespeople and the consultants will answer your questions a little bit more honestly. Right. They'll kind of get to it, and if they're frustrated because someone didn't, you know, their drawings were incomplete all the time. Again, it's just information that you want to know. And sometimes we'll end up, we'll go through this process and sure they didn't get a perfect, you know, if, if, they've, if they get perfect scores on everything, you're like, huh, what's going on? Right. But I like to know kind of, okay, we're going to hire this person, but we know that, you know, this is, these are things that we'll have to work with. Um, right. I like that too because I have to say again relating it to interior designers as a as a as even as a small designer that's hiring an assistant if the assistant says that they had a position with another designer I never considered asking the prospective employee not only would the present employer or the previous employer give them a reference, but when you worked with that designer, did you work with any particular vendors and would you give one of those as a reference? That's, right. that's re because I have to say, look, I know with window works, I'm constantly working with the juniors and the project managers for interior designers. So some firms that I work with are solo firms and the entire process is handled by the designer, the site meeting, the POs and everything else. But other firms I work with, even if they only have two or three employees, they are often sending their project manager or their junior for these vendor measures. Right. Right. And so that's great because we do, you know, you know how somebody acts when your boss is not there is very telling. Very telling. And, and you can get that information. And, and sometimes if it's if it's someone locally and, you know, they work with another designer, mm -hmm. um, you can. And, and, and if they if one thing to really I should back up that it's good to ask is, you know, if they have a, a current job and they're interviewing, but. <laughs> But right, you, can't have, you right. have to be very careful with who you check and, and right. be re, re, very respectful of that. But if it's, you know, if two it's jobs ago or whatever, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love to ask people, oh, do you know so-and-so? You know, it's it's a great way yes. to, to get that real true character test because, again, you ideally are hiring for the long term and you want to, you know, check the boxes as you can. So, right, um, right. And finding different disciplines you ask, you know, a, a former client, if you can get a former client, that's amazing, mm -hmm. you know, to see, you know, how, how did that person handle themselves in meetings? And, you know, if, when you brought up a challenge with them, how did they respond? Or if you changed a closet design 10 times and then went back to the first design. <laughs> <laughs> did they tell you exactly what they thought of you? That's what you want to know. <laughs> That because sometimes you do in the design world, as we all know, you get back to that first design, and if that person is frustrated and doesn't like that, then again, it's just telling, and you need right. to know that. So, um, <laughs> it's again, what you say to the client and what you say in your office. <laughs> exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the other reference questions I'll ask, um, and and. It, kind of goes back to the the phone interview asking questions that are similar that I asked on the phone the first time you know who did you report to and, and um, how are their technical you know the technical drawings um, were they dependable it's kind of an easy one and usually if someone lists a reference that person is probably going to give a good mm -hmm. reference so I try to dig a little bit deeper like you know, um, what areas, if any, you know, like development improvement were ever communicated to him or her and how did they respond? Mm. Because that will ask them if they ever, you know, need, were told they needed to improve X, Y, or Z and how did that person take it? Right. 
Right. Um, right. And that, that yeah. question, and that's a less um, it's it's a question that's easier to answer as opposed to what were they bad at? What did they not get better at over time? It's like, oh, did you have conversations that related to things that they needed to improve on and how did they handle it? Because it could be, oh, in the beginning they, you know, struggled with X, Y, Z, but we discussed it and they went out of their way and really pulled it up to snuff or blah, blah, exactly. blah. Right. That's That's yep. also interesting to know. Or if they answer, um, we don't do performance reviews, <laughs> then you might know that that person doesn't, hasn't received any. And that can be as difficult yes. because if someone has graduated from school, their first job out of college, but were never um, told what wasn't going right, mm. then if you're the first person to do that, <laughs> how that person could take it can be very challenging. That's so true. again, it's all knowing where they're coming from. Right. And then you know, why did they leave? And would you simply re rehire them? Right. I like that one too. Would you rehire them? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. what, of course you want to hear yes. But, and one question that I always ask, which, um, I don't always ask, I ask if I really mean it. And if we're so far, you know, we're down the road, we want to hire this person. I will ask a reference, you know, um, you know, we're going to, we really would like to hire this person. We, you know, think they're a good fit for our firm. Is there anything that we could know about them that we know we should, well, that we know that we'll need to work with? Mm. And sometimes if you ask that question at the end of the phone call, they can, and this has happened before where they'll say, you know, you know, yeah, you know, he sometimes needs a little extra time with this or that, or mm -hmm. he, you know, he can and then it's, it's just, and I, we hired the person and we, but we knew that right. this is something we're going to need to work with. And also too, sometimes it's not something that is a deal breaker for you at all. Right. So like I, you're recalling a time when I did a reference for someone that was going to be our showroom coordinator, the admin position. And I remember calling the, she was moving from one state to another. So there was no problem calling her previous employer. Right. And so in talking with him at one point, I said, would you consider this person somebody who is always looking to better themselves and always looking to, you know, make improvements and something like that. Right. And, or how would you answer that question if I said, is this someone? And it was so funny because his answer was, oh, no, I, w I would not consider her to be that kind of a person. And I just was like, oh, really? And so the point is, without going back and forth verbatim, the reality is, is that what he he took it to mean and what he was expressing was that this person is not a person that comes into a company and wants to run up the ladder. This is right. a person who wants to get a good job, do a really good job at that job and have that job for a long time. And I was like, oh, that's my kind of admin because, you know, right. next up the ladder is me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> I'm not yeah. going anywhere. Like if you're going right. up the ladder from admin, you're going to go on the road and sell. And that's that's, right. You're not doing that, you know? And so, and so it was interesting, you know, the way that you delve into some of these things is your point, you know what I mean? To say, and I love the way that you said it, that I, we, we really want this person. We've already made, you know, a somewhat of a decision that this person we feel is a good fit for us, but knowing that we want to hire this something, is there something you could share that I'm, that I might be facing? You know what I mean? Right. So that's cool. Exactly. Right. Because it could be something that like, oh, that's awesome. She doesn't want to move up the ladder. Yay. <laughs> that's exactly what we need. We need somebody who's going to be, you know, a utility person and, right. and be that. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's an approachable way to kind of get information that you need, but know that, you know, the reference wants to do right by the person yes. who's, yes. You know, who they're, you know, giving a reference for. And so, um, but, but God, that's what you need out of this, you know, information. Right. You could do a reference check and they say, oh, great, great, great. And then you say, okay, we check the references, but you didn't do it to get the information that you need mm -hmm. because not everyone's perfect and right. we don't expect everyone to be perfect. But if we know that they need extra time in in the design side, but the technical side, they're, they're really strong. Then mm -hmm. we know, okay, coming into the project or coming into the office, 
let's you know spend more time then, here or give more time right. there yes yeah exactly yeah exactly. no i mean because in that case i was leaning towards this hire to begin with and that was the that was the slam dunk for me i was like oh right. okay. because you know somebody moving out of state you know their first job it could be like okay stepping stone doing this and 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 of course that has happened at window works a lot because you know mo- a lot a lot of people are inclined to say i'm going to work here but then i eventually want to or they grow out of it is what happens it's like they're very happy to come in because it's very hard to run window works it's very hard it's a lot of moving parts we run a lot of clients through in a in a month's time you know we're gonna we're gonna run you know 800 clients through our books in a year that's a lot of moving parts to right. make everybody happy a lot of personalities you plus you have all the installers all of the salespeople, and so what happens is there's a good two three four five years before you really experience mastery with this job okay mm-hmm. it's not rocket science i'm not saving cancer at window works but it is a hard job to do okay and right. but the reality is is that once you get the handle on that it's so many people's personality is what's my next challenge and what he told me was her whole mojo is to get mastery and then sail through (laughs) and i was like yes Yes. that's your girl (laughs) that's it that's my lady (laughs) right right and she was she was very good for eight years and then she actually something happened personal she needed to go home and take care of her parents in Michigan again and, and so she needed to go back home but she was an excellent employee and it was everything that I saw on the resume was good and then that statement was the slam dunk and it turned out to be really fantastic and I would take her back if she moved back I'd have to make room because I love Adriana too but I'd take her back <laughs> right right which is yeah and in, in that interview process to find out that that tidbit is, mm. oh, it's a gold mine yes, for sure. Yes, yes. So it's awesome. I love all of the advice that you shared. And this has been a long conversation, but I do want to ask the one question again, because I know this is the, the, all of this is great. This is all good information. Just, just make our brain think about the, the being very clear on what we want and what we need in an employee. It doesn't have to be, there's all different levels of skill sets wh- coming from the social side, coming to, going to the technical side. And depending on where we are in our company, it's perfectly fine. Every answer is right. It's whatever is right for us as the owner of our company that we need. Okay. But I know the number one thing that everybody struggles with whether it's your first hire or your fifth hire, meaning not the fifth time you hired, but the fifth person to your firm is evaluating when it's time for that hire and, and really having that, you know, look in the mirror moment of I've going to be responsible for somebody's salary. So could you give us a little conversation about that, Rebecca? Oh, the crystal ball. We just <laughs> <had one. laughs> yeah, it is. It is so kind of that kind of a question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it for us, it seems like, you know, when a few months are, are happening, we're just, you know, we know everyone's buried and we keep mm. getting inquiries and things are, you know, they keep going to contract and we're just like, oh my goodness, you know, and mm-hmm. we can see this, see this trend that's not, an overnight trend, but is ongoing. And also I think we see in our employees that people are getting pretty, pretty burned out because of, because of where they're at, knowing all the projects down the pipeline, there's this moment of, you know what, I think we're, I think we're ready. Mm -hmm. So it's a tough, a tough question. I think each business is so different and, you know, the, the climate, the way it is, is scary. Are we in a bubble? Are we not in a bubble? And that's always a hard thing, but, um, and then sometimes people leave and then it's a natural, Mm -hmm. um, okay, we need to replace, not just fill this position because maybe it's okay. Let's take a minute and look at our structure and do we want that position again? Or do we want something different and kind of going back to the drawing board? But I think it, it really pays off to get, if it's just you sit down and, take some time to think about it. If you have a team, ask the team, Mm. get everyone's feeling. Are you guys, you know, it could be that you ask, are you guys up for putting a little bit more work in so that, and and we keep lean and mean and we don't hire Mm. or is everyone at the breaking point that 
we need to hire. Mm -hmm. And I think that you'll get different opinions. And I think if, if, (laughs) you know, but, but again, it's kind of just taking the time to look at that part of the business. And I think your answer is there more often than not. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny because in a recent discussion with uh, uh, designers that I'm coaching, it came up and it was regarding a person's first hire and about the fear of the first hire. And one of the things that I said was, you're probably always going to be have you're always going to experience fear when you hire because yes. like I I used us as an example last May we hired Rich I did a power talk Friday with Rich a couple of weeks ago as the sales manager for the awning side of our business and here we are 35 years in business and myself and my husband Vin and our partner Bill kicked this around for three or four months because I think that if you are a thinking human being, you understand that when you hire somebody, you're taking responsibility for that person. And yes. so as a solo, you're afraid. You're afraid for yourself. You're afraid, you know, am I going to have the money to pay? And that's because you are a person with a conscience and you don't want to needlessly take somebody and then find out three weeks, three months later that you can't afford them. And so, so that's the one thing that I often say to designers is, you cannot wait until you're not afraid because you if you're a, not a psychological pathological person you not a psychological if you're not a pathological person that doesn't think about other people you're always going to experience fear but if you're looking at your work desk if you are never finishing your work and you know you're working efficiently if you, because you're never finishing and you're having to say no to projects because you've got two or three in the pipeline or four and you it's all you can do but to get the work work out the door, then it's time to hire. (laughs) You know what I mean? But you can't like, so I feel like sometimes we all experience the fear. And if we've never done it before, we think there's going to be a moment where I'm not going to be afraid. That's not, that's my advice. You're not going to get to the moment where you're not afraid. You will get to the moment. Like you said, you go to the staff. So instead of going to the staff, just look at yourself and say, have I worked every Saturday and Sunday for the last six weeks? And I'm still overwhelmed on Monday. If the answer is yes, you need an employee. (laughs) <laughs> you know? Exactly. And that financial mm-hmm. risk is, you know, it's certainly a big leap, but you can often make more by bringing on someone that's than right. you can just trying to get at things that you just can't get to. Well, that's right. Because at that point, if you are looking at yourself and you're looking at your work production, you are spending hours every week doing things that are below, my term is below your pay grade. Right. You know, it's you, you are spending hours going to the design center, you know, finding the linen fabric that matches your primary pattern. Are you kidding me? Like, right. <laughs> you know, right. a, a skilled, you know, graduate designer can do that for you. So exactly. that's the thing. So if you are busy and you're starting to, and the thing is, the truth is, it doesn't even have to be the, the, the evaluation of my doing seven days a week. It could be that I'm a solo that has established that I will only work during the hours of my children in school. You see, that's valid. I only want to work from 9.30 to 3 o'clock every day. And now all of a sudden, I have so many projects that I don't remember the last time I played with my kids from 3 o'clock before I had to make dinner at 5. And so you have two choices. You either start saying no to projects because you want to stay small, or you hire somebody so that you can still work within the hours that your children in school. Again, what are we saying? We come back to clarity. We come back to what's for us first. Right. Right. What do we need? Whether I am Rebecca Richardson with a 19 person firm and hiring high level people or I am Sally Smith in the middle of my studio on the third floor and I'm trying to decide on my first design assistant or not. It's get clear on what you're experiencing what you have in your your pipeline and what are the skills and the tasks that this person would do that frees you up to do money producing things. If you can answer that and you can see that once you get those things off your plate and you do more money producing things, which is the design and design consultations and, and networking and pipeline building. Yeah. Then don't worry that you're afraid because you're going to be afraid, but do it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And spend the time on the front end to really find that person (laughs) that, you know, 
lets you do what you do best. Yes, yes. And that's when you then go back and you take notes on this episode with Rebecca and all the things that she suggests on those those qu- kinds of questions that delve into and help you really make a quality decision. And here's the other thing. You're going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. Just don't worry about it. You can't, you can't, you can't. You, it's a process until you do it two or three or four times that it, it, it may be successful every time. And if you have a dud, you know, cut your losses, move on. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, but these are the types of things that help you avoid making mistakes. If you get clear first, you get clear on the person you, you need, the, you get clear on the skills that they should have and don't avoid it. Don't, don't hire somebody because they have a great personality, but Hey, they don't have any of the criteria that you wrote down yesterday before you met them. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> but they're so nice. <laughs> I know it's hard when they're nice because you just have to, you know, it pays to do, do your homework. Yeah. Yeah. Well then, and that's when you got to start to think about your dollar bills. Nice yes. is one thing, but somebody that's going to move the needle and be productive for you, it's your hard-earned m- money that you are sharing with somebody and you are um, giving to them. You know what I mean? That's right. really what it is. You're sharing what you have brought in the door. So it needs to be somebody that is worth it. So yeah. I, I love it. Awesome. Thank you so great. much. Oh, yeah. absolutely. It's great to be here. Yeah, we were in need of a conversation like this, Rebecca. So I really do appreciate your coming and sharing all this this information with us. And so your uh, firm is Charles Cunniff, right? Say it for me again. Correct. Charles Cunniff Architects. <laughs> it's that second F that throws you off, right? I know. It's a tricky <laughs> one. It sure is. <laughs> so Charles Cunniff Architects, you're located, as I said in the introduction, in Colorado. And uh, maybe one day you'll have to come back and talk to us all about what you do as the director of marketing. <laughs> oh, I would love to. I would love my other hat. It's exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> that's another Great. thing we all have to do. We have to fill that pipeline, right? It is. It is essential. It really is. Exactly. So, well, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Have a good one. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.